All right. You ready to rock and roll? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and get, given the opportunity to, to talk to Brad about something other than our shared love of the movie The Last Dragon. Um, <laughs> the, the, Show enough. <laughs> no one's going to know that in the audience. Uh, that's, that's deep. All right. That's deep in the 80s. All right. Um, but innovation and, and reinvention, especially in 2016 with the turbulence that we're seeing in Silicon Valley and in tech in general, in business, uh, is, is a particularly interesting topic. And uh, th this morning, you guys at Intuit put out some data on how the tax season went, which of yes. course is like your Super Bowl. And I couldn't help but notice that it went a lot better than last year. Right. 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 Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, given that your stock is, is near all time highs now and, and the pain of last year is probably in the past, let's, let's start there. Okay. At what point in 2015 did you know that your most important product was going sideways? Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> Thank you for putting that out there for everybody. You know, you know pretty early on when you're a product based business whether the product you've put out in front of customers is what they expected. And last year, we had a breakthrough web experience, TurboTax Online, but we had tried to bring the desktop customers into the future. And the one thing we know about our desktop customers is they get one year older every year. They wanted the same product we had given them the year before. So we forced some change on those customers they weren't ready for. They let us know about it. We had to sort of recoup. We apologized publicly. I actually put a YouTube video out and said, I sincerely apologize. We weren't listening to you. And we promised we would bring back last year's product for them this year. So we knew very early on that we had forced a change on a customer that was not what they wanted. This year, we listened to the customer. We continued to innovate on the web. And we gave them what they wanted in the desktop. And as you said, we had the best tax season we've had in 13 years. How, as a CEO, how do you lead the recovery out of something like that? Because, I mean, that's tough yeah. inside a company when it's kind of like, okay, well, we messed up. Is there any way to fix it? Can we, can we kind of tweak this fix or do we have to completely back off of what our entire plan was? Yeah, you know, there's, there's a theory we have inside the company. We try to be a 33-year-old startup. We were born in the era of DOS. And then we had to make it to Windows and then the World Wide Web, and now we're in the cloud with mobile and social and global and big data implications. And the one thing we've had to learn along the way is you have to treat failure and success exactly the same way. It's an opportunity to learn. And so if you can actually speed up that cycle time, step back, recover, admit that it's wrong, and move forward, your company's going to be fine, the employees are going to be fine, and most importantly, the customers are going to feel good that you're listening to them. So that's what we did, is as soon as we saw it happening, I stood up and took responsibility, said, this is on me. We know better than this. Let's get back to our knitting and let's get the customers what they want. And then we were able to pull out of it. Now, why did it happen to begin with? I mean, because it seems like moving to the cloud, good idea. Yes. Yeah. A lot of companies doing it. The ones yeah. that aren't doing it fast enough right. are getting bowled over and left in the dust. So it was a good idea. Why didn't it work? Well, it didn't work because we didn't stop to realize we have two different customer groups. So if you look at TurboTax, it hit its 50-50 point of online tax filing and desktop tax, tax filing in 2005. Last year, 90% are in the cloud, 10% are desktop. We said, wow, maybe that last 10% aren't moving because they want the experience to feel the same, look the same, and just basically be seamless, and they won't know if it's in the cloud or not. So we changed the user interface, we changed some of the feature functionality, and what we realized was these customers aren't going to go anywhere. The day they stop filing on desktop is the day they stop filing. And so we had to step back and say, let's not assume they want what these other customers want, let's treat them as a market of one, and let's delight them with what they want. So that was the mistake that we made, and now we know that we got to deliver each customer specifically what they're looking for. It reminds me of a time um, I was in newspapers before I was in broadcast uh, at, the, at the San Jose Mercury News. And this was when blogs were first becoming a thing. And uh, you know, I, was, I was heavily into blogs, was doing a, my own blog on the side. Matt Marshall, who founded VentureBeat, was then working at the Mercury News trying to get them to embrace this Silicon Beat thing that he was building. But the paper was focused in a totally different direction. And I had this idea, because it was part of this bigger newspaper company, well, let's, instead of trying to build everything ourselves, let's reach across 
the company, and so the, the people who are in Philadelphia, they can contribute to the sports blog by blogging about the teams out there, and we can contribute, and we can create this whole blog network, and, you know, I was, I was selling it to corporate. One of the editors called me into the office and said, you know, I'm trying to fix the website, and you keep talking about blogs. You need to stop it. And, and I thought I was going to get fired. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, it's the timing of the idea was more important than the idea itself. Yeah. Well, we've been through plenty of those ourselves. Uh, we launched our online version of small business accounting the same year we launched TurboTax, which was 1999. This year was the first year we had half of small businesses choosing the cloud and half choosing desktops. So we've had it out there for a long time, but customers are now starting to discover the cloud in small business. One, one of the things that I think is especially relevant to people about what you've been going through over the last couple of years is what you're deciding not to do. Right, right. Um, there are a couple of things that you've cut, demand force being one. I remember you know, talking to you on the phone when you guys announced the demand force deal. We're paying, what was it, over $400 million? Yeah. For you know, this, this suite that's going to help small businesses to manage, blah, blah, blah. It sounds great. And then I see this really, you guys are cutting it? Yeah. What's going on? I mean, isn't building out suites a good thing? Quicken. I mean, that's like Intuit. Intuit yeah. is Quicken. At least it was at a certain point. And you guys uh, sold that off. Yes. Why? Well, we've had to look at the landscape. One of my favorite quotes is actually a joke in the Silicon Valley that many of you have, I'm sure have heard, which is, why was the Almighty able to create heaven and earth in seven days and seven nights? Because he didn't have legacy technology and an installed base of customers to have to worry about. And what we had is we have a new chapter of great in the company. We are now an open platform that is cloud-based using mobile devices, and all the data flows between our products, and every product makes another product stronger. So consumers using our Mint product are also small business customers using QuickBooks, and we want the data to flow. Those businesses we chose to sell were really good businesses, but they were standalone. They didn't make the ecosystem stronger, and they weren't built out as platforms. So we had two choices. One choice was we could leave them in the company but not resource them, and then no engineers would want to work on them, no one would want to be a part of the business, or we could actually sell them to new owners so we could narrow our focus on the future, and that's what we chose to do. So this gets to the reinvention piece and the type of tough decision that a lot of smaller companies, companies of all sizes, are having to make now. What pressured you into the point where you knew you couldn't have your cake and eat it too? Because a lot of people would say, okay, well, here's a problem we might have to deal with down the road. Eh, we don't have to cut them now. They're still making money for us. Yeah. What pressured you to do it? Well, I think it was more a realization. We've lived through this over a lot of chapters over 33 years. And one of the things that one of the board members shared with me was when Steve Jobs came back to Apple after they acquired Next. And I was watching this interview where developers were pounding him on things he was choosing to shut down. And someone asked him, well, which is your favorite product at Apple? And he said, actually, all the ones we chose not to build because that allowed us to put greatness into the ones that we did. And so as we looked at this opportunity, our small business accounting in the cloud was on fire. TurboTax Online grew 15% this tax season, and it's 25 years old. We now have a 65 plus percent market share. Our accounting products are on fire. And we have these other businesses that don't fit that portfolio. And even though they're growing well, I have to have a choice of either feed them a little bit and slow down the growth of these or lean into these and actually find homes for the others. So it was the clarity of knowing the future that allowed us to make decisions about things that were great in the past but weren't going to be a part of the future. What is a mistake that maybe you see smaller companies making when it comes to reinvention? Lots of companies try to pivot at certain points. Some of them fall on their faces when they try that, that dance step. Uh, the mistake is they fall in love with their solution and what you need to do is fall in love with the problem. So our problem began at a kitchen table when our founder watched his wife struggle to balance the family checkbook in the era of DOS. And he said, there has to be a better way, and our mission is to improve people's financial lives. 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. One out of two small businesses fail in the first five years. We want to increase their odds of success. We have been in love with that problem for 33 years. We've solved it through DOS, with a picture of a check on a DOS screen. We've solved it through Windows. We've solved it through the World Wide Web. We're now solving it through the cloud. And this year, you can take a picture of your tax documents, press a finger, and your taxes are done. We just have to continuously adopt the new technologies to still be in love with the same problem. You were on the board of Yahoo. Yes.
Some, some questions don't deserve a response. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of companies from the early part of the web era yes. that had a hard time making the transition, for whatever reason, to being relevant now. You've got a long scope and a great position to see another a number of companies that have made the leap, you know, uh, Adobe being one, you and I both right. know Chantanu, yeah. and, and some that haven't. What's the difference? I think what we have to always keep in mind is companies sometimes fall into the trap of revering the past. You have to respect the past but not revere it. So the first thing you have to be clear about with your employees and with yourself is what about the company isn't going to change? And usually that's the values of the company and the mission of the company. Everything else should be fair game. You should be asking yourself, what are the newest best practices that we can adopt and adapt and evolve to to go after the same mission with the same purpose? And I think many, many times people will fall in love with, well, this is our product. You know, this is Adobe Acrobat or this is QuickBooks on desktop. And if you fall into that trap, then it's basically an innovator's dilemma. And it's not if, it's when you're going to be disrupted. So I think the important thing is to be really clear about the mission or the problem and then be very open to going after it in any sort of new way you can. Um, there are a lot of smaller startups these days that are nibbling around the edges of the same kinds of problems that you like to work on. Yeah. A lot of them have Zen in their name for some reason. Yeah. Um, like it's they're very, a California thing, man. Yeah, they're very calmly looking to eat your lunch. Yeah. How do you think about that kind of competition and how to, I don't know if you think about it as responding to it or just sort of deal with it? Because even if you don't think you need to respond to it, your employees, I'm sure, are saying, well, what about this company? What about that company? Should we be worried about this company? Yeah, you know, first of all, honest to goodness, we love our competition. We respect our competition. Yogi Berra once said, you don't blow on someone else's candle to make your own candle glow brighter. So what do we do? The first thing we do is every quarter, when our product teams come in to share something with me, I ask them to tell me about three competitors I've never heard of. Coming out of Stanford dorm rooms, coming out of dorm rooms in the Midwest, coming out of the basement of their mother's house. And I ask them to tell me what are three things about what they're doing that we admire. I finish that meeting with, it used to be called plagiarism, now it's called benchmarking. Let's actually go do something with that new learning. That's one thing we do. The second thing we've done is we've opened up our platform. So our products are now open to work with all of our competitors. And we can start to see whether our customers are adopting these competitive ideas. And if they are, we're either going to build that feature or we're going to ask that company if they want to be a part of into it. And we've bought 16 companies in the last 12 months that were a part of our platform. And so we basically embrace competition. The good news is if we have a product that is solving the problem better, we will win. And if we are not, we're either going to learn or we're going to acquire. 16 companies in the past 12 months? Yes. With valuations being what they are? Yes. How do you deal with the valuation issue? Let I mean, are you just... Let me tell you what, I learned the hard way. You never overpay or underpay for an acquisition that works. You always overpay for an acquisition that doesn't. So if you can actually figure out that you see a real reason to believe this is going to work, then the price tag comes down to something you can live with when you go to bed at night. So are you telling me there aren't the entrepreneurs, even a great entrepreneur, great idea that just asks for a ridiculous amount of money and you have to say no? Yeah. It, oh, there are. There are. So you decided not to overpay. Yeah, well, in that instance, we always have a great meeting. I usually go to their offices. I want to learn from them. I ask them to show me their organization, see how they make decisions. Obviously, we've been studying their product for a time. And then I sit down and talk about our mission and their mission and what their aspirations are. And if it's a financial outcome, I usually know it's not the right person because they won't fit in our company culture. If it's someone who says, hey, I have a big vision, but here's the price tag, then I tell them, boy, that's not affordable. We can either kind of be friends and talk later, but you need to know we're going to be in the same playing field as you. We're just going to have different jerseys on. And they can always decide if price is important or not. How did you get mint for such a steal? Was, wasn't it like $150 million or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Aaron Patzer had the same mission that our founder did 33 years ago. He just had the more contemporary how. And what was amazing was when he was 16, he reverse engineered Quicken for his mother and father, and he didn't like the way we categorized expenses. So he reverse engineered our product and got it to do something better, and then he turned it into Mint. And so we said to him, would you like to come in? And by the way, when we acquire companies, we want the entrepreneurs to actually run big parts of the company. So not only will you run Mint, we'll give you Quicken too. 
the product that you always loved but didn't think was fresh enough. So he got to take over a big piece of responsibility, and that's why he came in. He wanted to be a part of something bigger than himself. And that kind of allowed you to get, get rid of Quicken, I guess. Well, uh, and we, we learned the hard way that we tried to get the desktop customers on Quicken to move to the Mint, and even though they didn't, uh, they didn't want to go to the cloud, so it was just like the other product we talked about. So, so they could yeah. go with a new owner and continue to enjoy That's right. Quicken. Um, we're, we're drawing to a close, so I, I want to focus in on how you enable reinvention from, from inside a company, because reinvention implies that somebody's idea that was a great idea at a certain time isn't working anymore. Right. How did the conversation go with the people who, who came up with Quicken when you decide it's time to get rid of this thing that's been so important to the company for so many years? It went incredibly smoothly because that person is Scott Cook, our founder, who still sits on the board, which means he's one of my bosses, and then sits on staff with me. And when we sat down and talked about our strategy and the clarity of the focus for the future, and then we talked about Quicken. I said, Scott, I know this must be emotional. This is what you started the company with. This is what your father took out a second mortgage on the home to back. How do you feel? And he said, Brad, intellectual honesty needs to prevail here. We are a growth company. Quicken is not a part of the future. It's a part of the past. And we need to find it a better home and move forward. He didn't blink an eye because he knew when he started the company, he said, I never st started this company. I didn't call it quick and I called it into it. I envisioned a product company that would have multiple products, not just one. And so it was actually a pretty smooth conversation. I wonder if that means Alphabet's going to like sell off the search engine or something. Is that like... That's for Larry and Sergey to answer. <laughs> I'll let them go. Probably not. That's still That's right. growing and, and That's right. making um, quite a bit of money. Well, I, I, I must say uh, it's been amazing to watch the changes that you've gone through over time um, in tax and then outside with, with Mint now, the transition to the cloud, something that a lot of people I know in this room can learn from. So thanks so much for Thank sharing you, your wisdom. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.